I uh, preached this at our youth event we just had called Ignite. Um, Eric was there, Lee was up there. I might bring them up here to finish the message for me later, see how much they paid attention that night. Um, after I preached it, someone came up and said, uh, you didn't tie the title in with your message. The title of the message that night was Walking Dead, or that afternoon was The Walking Dead. I thought it was so cool. You know, it was like the TV show. I had a nice picture made. If any of you guys see my stuff on Facebook, um, I try to make an illustration that goes along with the, the message. So it was a guy walking in the desert, looked real cool like The Walking Dead movie, or the TV show. And then a youth came up afterwards and said, uh, you never tied the title in with your message. I'm like, what? I said, yeah, I did. At the beginning, I talked. He was like, no, you told us what it could have been for The Walking Dead, but you never told us why your title was that. Of course, that was my son, Stonewall, that told me that. Um, he's always my most honest critic. Uh, my wife, if she doesn't enjoy it, she'll just say nothing. But Stonewall's always good about telling me what I did wrong. So I figured there was probably a better title for it. And uh, there was. It's uh, Running on Empty is the actual title of this message. I mistitled it the first time I, I preached it. Um, so let's look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. It says, Now Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, the queen. And Jezebel really ran the kingdom of Israel. Um, there's two women in the Bible that we kind of correlate uh, spirits with. A lot of people get Jezebel messed up with Bathsheba. Bathsheba's spirit is uh, a woman that's kind of outgoing sexual, sexually wise. Um, she's not real reserved. Um, Jezebel is a wicked woman. She's very dominating. Uh, she wants to rule the relationship. Which I've got my wife is um, outspoken. She's very strong-willed. But she understands the big, biblical principle of a man head of the household. Um, that doesn't mean I rule with an iron fist because my wife wouldn't allow that anyway. But she understands that when it comes down to it, decisions that are made in the house between me and my family and me and God, when it comes down to it, I have to account for where my family goes and how we do and how we uh, allocate our resources and how we um, serve God and pray with God. That's on me. Um, I'm the, the priest of my household. And Jezebel didn't believe so. Uh, she ran the kingdom with an iron fist. And a lot of people would say that the last decision Ahab made was, I do. And that was about the end of it. <laughs> she uh, had gotten Israel into idol worship. Uh, they worshipped Baal. They worshipped a few other uh, false prophets. So that's Jezebel. And let's see. So Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. And how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say... May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do, not make, I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Let's play, pray real quick. Um, Father God, I ask you to speak through me. Um, I've studied this, Lord, and I know it, but I don't want to speak what I want to speak. I want to speak what needs to be heard. Lord, use me. Ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Elijah, um, one of the most famous prophets in the Bible. When I went back and started studying for this message, I was surprised to realize how little there actually is about Elijah in the Bible. 
uh, he just pops up on the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17 when God tells him to go stand before Ahab. Uh, me, I wonder how many people God went to that was named Elijah and told him this before this Elijah actually obeyed. Because Elijah in Hebrew means Eliyahu. It means my God is Yahweh. And the problem in Israel at the time was the serving of many gods. So I got to think that God had gone to several different Ahab. I mean, he wasn't a prophet before then. The Bible doesn't say so. I couldn't find anything. Um, if anyone sees any different, please let me know so I can stop saying what I just said. But as far as I know, he wasn't a prophet before God told him to go stand before Ahab. So he tells him, go stand before Ahab and tell him there's going to be a drought on the land due to your wickedness, your wife's wickedness, and the duplicity of your guys' religion in Israel. And Elijah does it, which says a lot for him anyway. Um, anytime you're talking about obedience with prophets, he's usually the first one you mention because stand before Ahab and telling him that he's wicked usually would be a death sentence. But he does it. And then God tells him, gives him a little inside information about a little brook, the brook Cherith in the Cherith Ravine. It says, I want you to go there, and I want you to drink out of the brook, and I'm going to have ravens bring you meat and bread to eat. And there are several commentators that I read that said a lot of the, some of the, the worship of these false idols for Ahab was that he would put out a full meal for these false gods. He would lay out a full meal, huge banquet, for a false god that was never going to consume any of it. There's a drought in the land, there's a famine, but he's still putting out a spread for these false gods. And that would be where these ravens were coming to get food to take to Elijah. That sounds like God. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the way he would work. Now I can't prove it, don't base any doctrine on it, but I think it's pretty cool. So he's hanging out at this brook and he's getting fed, and the brook dries up. God tells him to move on. Well, that seems like kind of inconsequential, but it's not, because the brook dried up. The ravens didn't stop bringing the food. The natural dried up before the supernatural stopped. Always. That's the way it works. See, there was nothing supernatural about the brook being there. It was just there. It's just a brook. Now God told him where it was at and said, go drink from it. Well, eventually with no rain, the brook's going to dry up. It's natural. So, like me, I was given a job supernaturally by God. The place wasn't hiring. I had just gotten clean, really clean. I was sort of clean before that, but I was really clean this time. And uh, I needed a job. And out of the blue, someone called me that I hadn't talked to in a long time. I said, hey, why are you calling me? He's like, well, this place uh, got a job opening. Can you do it? I said, what's it doing? We're running a screw gun. Yeah, I can do that. We'll come in and talk to the guy. I started the next day. That was God. I needed the job. God provided. If the manufacturing of buses dries up, that's not God taking my provision away from me. That's just a natural course of events. That doesn't mean God can no longer provide for me. He'll just move me on. So that's, we need to understand that. When we have something that God has instructed us to take, and that thing dries up, we shouldn't be screaming, where's God in this? You know, I, I don't understand. Why do, you, why, do you let me go? why do you let me down? Why do you let me go? He didn't. He just dried up. He's got something else for you. God had something else for Elijah. He says, there's a woman that I want you to go see. He had obviously been working on this woman from her end, saying, there's something coming. Hang on, there's something coming. God will usually work on both ends when a miracle is about to happen. If, you know, someone comes and tells you, uh, hey, you're supposed to quit your job and move down to Florida and uh, start a church, and God has not prompted you in your heart to start a church, probably ought to just put that up on the shelf until God works on your end of it. Um, but Elijah goes and finds this woman and she's picking up sticks to make her last meal that her and her son are going to eat and then they're going to die desperate situation and 
Elijah, being the nice guy that he is, says that's fine. Go fix your bread and eat and die, but bring me some of it first. Nice guy. Uh, pastor says that if he didn't know for an absolute fact that God would provide after that, he'd be the biggest jerk in the world. A lot of people have trouble with preachers that tell you to sow seeds. There's a difference between a preacher speaking about sowing seeds for prosperity than a preacher that gets up on TV and says, if you send me $500 by tomorrow, God will send you $10,000 the next day. It's a big difference. One's a flim-flam artist, another's preaching the word of God. Elijah was getting her to sow a seed. Bring me a little bit first. Supernaturally, he begins to fill her bin. She never runs out. For as long as she needs to eat. doesn't say for how long. It says for many, many days. Again, the supernatural did not end. God's provision did not end. So after that little time, the woman's son dies. And because she had been faithful, Elijah was there to raise him up. That was another supernatural thing that God did through Elijah. Raise the woman's son. So all of this is about to go down. The time is about right for Elijah to go stand before Ahab again. And he said, well, I've got one more thing you need to do. We need to uh, set up this spiritual steel cage match up on Mar Mount Carmel. I want to show my power. God's ready to show his power, show that he is the true God, that he is the one God. So they all go up to Mount Carmel, 850 prophets, 400 for Baal, 450 for all the other prophets that they served. And they have a duel. If you listen to uh, the band Disciple at all, they've got a great song, God of Elijah, if you listen to it. It lays the entire thing out right there, pretty much word for word. Um, the false prophets couldn't do anything. Elijah says, well, that's cool. Um, go ahead and douse the sacrifice, get it wet, and again, and again. I want it really wet. And he calls fire down, burns up the sacrifice, and proves God is God. So after this goes down, he tells Ahab, the rain's coming, you better get down the mountain. And then Elijah supernaturally beats him down the mountain, raced him down on foot, so he beat him in another contest. I don't know if he told him I'd race you down or not, but he did. And then, this is where we come to. After all of this, after Elijah has seen all of these things that God has done, time after time, he gets a death threat from a queen. And the Bible says he's afraid. That blows my mind. That this prophet that had called down fire and killed 850 prophets by the sword gets one word from a woman that serves false gods and it says he's afraid. Makes no sense to me. I don't, um, I don't know. I don't get it. But really, isn't that what we do with God? He's provided for us. He's delivered all of us. He's provided eternal life for everybody. But one little threat from a bill collector, from someone in your past, someone saying, I know who you really are, and we flip out, say, where's God in this? So he finds himself lying under a bush, wanting to die. So that proves he wasn't afraid of her killing him. Right? That can't be what he was afraid of. Because he, he goes miles and miles and miles away. 
off by himself, lays under a bush, and asks God to kill him. Well, why didn't you just stay there and let the queen kill you? He wasn't afraid of dying. Elijah was afraid of living his life. He was tired of fighting. And I don't know of a better illustration for those of us in recovery than that right there. It never stops. I hate telling people that. People ask, I just quit smoking. When's the craving end? It doesn't. Well, that sucks. I don't want to hear that. I know. It sucks. When do I stop wanting to drink? You don't? I don't. I, every time I walk through, I think I use this illustration every time I stand up here, but I have to do it all the time. I think I go to Martin's six days a week, and I have to walk through the liquor aisle. Walmart, Meyer, it's all there. I was just thinking the other day how I was alone. Family was going to be gone all night. Don't want to stay in at a friend's. Carol was somewhere. Sydney was staying with my mom. And I was going to be by myself. That was a drinking night. Six years ago. Six years later, Satan still brings that up. Says you can drink. You ain't got to get crazy with it. Just get a six pack. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the same argument you used six years ago. Sounds good, though. I probably could. What? What am I doing? Elijah wasn't afraid of dying. He was tired of fighting. He was empty. That's really what I'm getting at right tonight. He was just spiritually empty. A lot of times we look at people, well, myself. People can look at me up here on this stage. I speak at my father-in-law's church all the time. So someone that's just coming in out of the drunk tank of Kosciuszko County walks in here and sees me standing up here. And they're, oh, well, that's, he's a man of God. You know, I, I can't. I can't get there. He's up on the stage. Not knowing six years ago, I was sitting on suicide watch in Kosciuszko County Jail. So if you don't have that story to bring to me, if you don't have the story of trying to walk in front of three trains and not being able to successfully complete that, one more thing I apparently sucked at was trying to kill myself. I failed four times. If you don't have that story to bring to me, then you've got nothing to say. God can do in your life what he's done in my life, what he's done in everybody's life. But the problem is you see that, and you think, wow, man, that, that guy's got it all together. God must have gave him something special. You know, when he saved him, he put something in him. No, the people that go on with God, they fill up with faith. That's the difference. Drop by drop, day after day, we fill ourselves up. We have to. That's the only way it works. Because Satan never stops. He will never stop. He has never stopped. Man, <laughs> you, you want to stop looking at porn like I did? You're screwed. Because phone, computer, TV, Victoria's Secret magazines. I don't Do they still have Victoria's Secret? That was kind of when I was eight teen years. Use whatever you can. Nash. <laughs> That's my man. <laughs> National Geographic. I mean, you can't be hoping that he's just going to stop because he's not. In this passage, there are three things that God said to Elijah as he was running away from the will of God on his life. Uh, I want to look at those three things uh, tonight. And I find it interesting that God doesn't beat Elijah up along his journey. By the time this is over, uh, Elijah travels like 200 miles. 
been talking to God the whole time. Saying, you know, I, I know you're there, God, but I'm still running. I'm still going. You know, I, I don't want to do it. But God doesn't beat him up. He doesn't ridicule him. He provides for him. I think we need to do that. You understand we're the body of Christ. We're God's hands in the world. Uh, the worst thing that we can do. And as recovery people, usually I think we're pretty good about not beating people up over their shortcomings um, because it wasn't very long ago. Now if you've been clean for 20 years, then maybe you're starting to lean that way. You forget how unholy you were. Um, nothing gets on my nerves more than that as a person that's looking for help in the house of God. And God's people are kicking him in the teeth as he's walking in the door. But God doesn't do that to Elijah. And uh, I know there's people sitting here today that you feel empty. You believe in God. You love God. But really you're at the same place, the same place of emptiness that Elijah was. You're just tired. It just hurts. I don't think I can do it. I know I was there. I mean, it's, I'm no prophet. <laughs> I just know. I fell quite a few times when I started walking this thing out. And it seems like, why bother? It was easier when I wasn't trying. But there is a hump. It does get easier. It doesn't necessarily stop, but it gets easier. Uh, there is a, a friend of mine that just quit smoking literally this week. And I told her, it gets, it gets easier. You know, keep, keep, keep pushing. Well, day four, she sends me a message on Facebook and says, you lied. <laughs> it hasn't gotten any easier. I said, well, all right, all right. After about a month, it gets easier. The first week is hell. Because every situation, every stress factor, every uh, meal you eat, every cup of coffee you drink, that's all you're thinking about is a cigarette. And it's the same way with every other drug and every other thing that we do. Um, three things. Uh, verse 5. The end of verse 5 says, All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. I don't know about you, but if you're looking for a life verse, hey, he ate, drank, and lay back down, went to sleep. It's a pretty good one. Put that one on your refrigerator. That's a good verse to remember. But it's not just about food. You know, when God was supernaturally providing for the Israelites. Not one person was sick. All on manna and quail and nobody got sick. The stuff that God gives us to eat will always be better than what the world will give you to eat. And for us, <coughs> that's the word of God. Verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate, drank, and strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And you're thinking, well, the mountain of God, that sounds pretty good. That's where the man of God should be, is the mountain of God. Um, it's actually Mount Horeb is also Mount Sinai, which that's a pretty famous mountain. Um, but Elijah was going the wrong way. Elijah was supposed to be going south. He was running away. Just because things seem religious doesn't necessarily mean it's what you're supposed to be doing. So, he was running away from the calling of God. Get up and eat. Several places in the Bible. I'll just mention a couple of them. Jeremiah 15.16 says, Your words were found, and I did eat them. Jeremiah 15.16. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 basically say the same thing. That we're baby Christians, we need milk. And as we mature into 
more mature Christians, we need meat. It's still food. Whether you're the baby Christian or the mature Christian, whether you're drinking milk or eating meat, it's still the word of God. It's still food. Jesus mentioned it several times himself. Man must not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he told Peter, feed my sheep. I don't think Jesus was telling Peter to feed his sheep. As far as I know, Jesus actually didn't have any sheep. So this is a spiritual feeding that Peter was supposed to partake in. So the angel's telling Elijah about food, real food. He's telling us about spiritual food. How do we eat that? Church. Get in a church, whether it's this church. And if you don't want bias, uh, don't ask any of the people that attend this church because we are very biased toward our church and our pastor and the word that comes from them. Um, it, Jesus saved my life. Pastor Lowe and the people here saved my family because I could have been saved and still lost my family if I didn't learn how to walk it out the right way. This church saved my family, which is no less of a miracle than the eternal life that Jesus Christ gives me. Um, you've got a Bible on your phone. I do. I have my phone with me all the time. Now you also have games and Facebook on your phone. So, you know, if you find it tough to read the Bible while well, you know Facebook's one click away, hey, and I use Facebook more than all you guys in here put together. Yeah, that's a lot of Bible. So, <laughs> it's not a bad thing. You know, I post five or six things a day. Um, but at the same time, use the technology. Um, Watch your words. It's funny how we can talk about reading the Word of God, but after you've been in the Word of God long enough, you know the Word of God. So now it's up to you to let that Word come out of your mouth instead of the garbage that wants to come out of your mouth. Uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The best way for you to hear the Word of God is to speak it. Um, a friend of mine was asking about me praying for a job for her. I said, yes, I'll pray. And then I turned around and sent her seven uh, scriptures on Facebook and said, speak these out loud. You have to speak them. It has to come out of your mouth because that's where the, the faith kicks in. It takes no faith to just read something silently. But you sound kind of dumb sometimes when you're speaking it out. You sound like a third grader reading out loud. But it's God's word out of your mouth that is power. That's your weapon. We've got so much around us. I can't tell you how many books are in my bookcase that I still haven't picked up. They look good. I'll borrow them from people. Hey, that looks good. Onto the bookcase. Never pull it back out. A person in... Uh, Siberia, or in the Sudan, or in China, would freak out if they saw just my bookcase. The books about the Bible. They would love that. The Bible's great, but if you can't get that, get a book about the Bible. They would love that, but it's, it's set in there and we don't read it. We don't look at it. And Joyce Meyer's got about 550 books out there. And they're all filled with word, and they're good. Heck, if you get one, get Battlefield of the Mind, and that pretty much covers all of them. If you get your mind right, that kind of helps in this whole process. That was my problem from the very beginning. You know what my problem was? I wanted to be a successful drinker. That was my mindset. I wanted to be a successful pot smoker. I just wanted to stop and get arrested. I didn't want that 14th arrest. 13th, all right. But 14, you start to tip over into kind of weird. That's what I wanted. Well, as soon as I realized I was never going to be a successful drinker, 
that I heard, one of my classes told me, one of my unsuccessful uh, IOP classes, my intention to outpatient classes, uh, one of the best things I read was a true alcoholic has a chemical in the brain that transfers alcohol into morphine. So by the time I realized that I was actually a heroin addict, not an alcoholic, I'm like, whoa. Well, I don't know too many heroin addicts that are very successful at life. Very few of them. We actually have one in this church. She was pretty good at it. But at the same time, you're still getting hit. You're still going to jail. You've still got these things going on that comes with being a heroin addict. So when I realized that it wasn't going to happen, I shifted my thinking into, okay, God, you can't help me do this like a normal person because I can't do it. I want to stop. I started with I wanted to take the one away from me. Um, yeah. I kind of look at it like Paul's thorn in the side. I asked a few times for God to take the one away from me. Why? Why would he take that away from me? I wouldn't need him then to stay sober. To stay sober. You know? It's like fear. We ask God, take away the fear. Well, if you would feed your faith, your fear wouldn't stand a chance. My grace is sufficient. We've got all this information. Podcasts. I devour podcasts. I love them. I can wear headphones at work. And I listen to probably six hours of podcasts a day. I find guys I like. I find guys that can preach the word. And I find guys that are word preachers. And I listen to them. And listen to them. And if I like one, I listen to it again and again. And I start preaching to myself. That's how I ended up here. I wasn't looking for this. I just listened to so much word, it just started coming out. What if Elijah would have had Abraham's podcast about faith? Where he could have listened to that over and over. Or Moses' podcast on leadership. That's a pretty good podcast to listen to, right? Moses walking around the desert talking about how leading these crazy, ungrateful people. We have all this stuff. And the Bible is the most important thing. If all of it went away, if all of the technology went away, and all of Joyce Meyer's books went away, and all of Joel Osteen's books went away, we still got the Word of God. I heard one person say that, uh, how did they put it? The tributaries are nice, but when you want good water, go to the river. And all these things that are offshoots of the Word of God are good. They're not bad, but you've got to get in the Word. Even podcasts are not a substitute for reading the Word and studying the Word yourself. When Carol goes, my wife goes out of town, I, I hate to say that I don't eat very well. She'll leave stuff in the fridge for me to eat, and I'm laying on the couch going, man, I'm hungry. Well, I know there's some lasagna in the fridge. I've I got to get it out and put it in the microwave. There's some beef jerky in the fridge. I get that. That's easy. If we don't make an attempt to eat good, we eat garbage. That's just the way it is. The world is filled with garbage. And I don't put down the world near as much as other people do because they're sinners and that's what they do. Um, but if that's all you eat, you're going to get fat, lazy, and you're not going to do what God wants you to do. The second thing was, let's go down to uh, verse 9. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I love that line. What are you doing here, Elijah? You can uh, emphasize any of those words and make it meaningful. You know, the word what. What are you doing? What are you doing staying up and watching HBO at 1 o'clock in the morning when you know you've got a porn issue? What are you doing? You know, what are you doing eyeing the blue moon beer in the liquor aisle when you know you like it? 
What are you even looking at? What are you doing? You know, he emphasizes you. What are you doing here, Elijah? Mr. Eliyahu? My God is Yahweh. What are you doing? You've seen my power. If anyone in the world should not be hiding out, it should have been Elijah. God, can I call down fire and just kill the woman? He didn't even ask. At least the disciples asked, can we just call down fire and kill him? Elijah had already done it. What are you doing? What are you doing here? What are you doing in this cave? Why have you separated yourself from everybody else? Why are you isolating yourself? That's where Satan wants us. He wants you isolated. That's, I never drank with my wife. Because by the time we got married, we got married, I was 20 years old. And in May, I turned 21 in June. And I was gone for three days after my birthday. So it was obviously going to be an issue. And after those three days, excuse me, of me being gone, she was kind of like, eh, maybe I don't want you drinking no more. So we never drank together. So I always drank in isolation. Even if I was at a bar with 200 people, I was still isolated because I was not with people that care about me. That's what isolation is. It doesn't mean you're just by yourself. It means you're away from the ones that love you. Elijah replies in verse 10. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. Those things are all true. But he had just survived all of those things with the help of God. They didn't change. He had always been very zealous. They had always rejected the covenant. They tore down the idols. Even when he was there, that hadn't changed. Your prophets have tried to put me to death. You just killed them. Why are you even bringing that up? You killed them. And the other thing that wasn't true was he wasn't the only one left. Obadiah had already told him back in verse 17 that I hid out a hundred prophets in the caves. He risked his own life, Obadiah did, to hide prophets. So Elijah's lying to God. Like, God don't know. Like, I'm the only one left. God's like, no, you're not. There's at least a hundred prophets in the cave. They told you about it. Quit lying. But he's alone and he's afraid. Verse 11, the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. That doesn't mean he didn't cause the wind. It just means that's not how he wanted to show his power to Elijah. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out to stand at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, remember, it's a whisper. He said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? And I was studying this you whisper to me? You're all powerful. You call fire down. You've seen your power. Why weren't you in the earthquake? Why weren't you in the fire? Why weren't you in the wind? God whispers because he's close. See, our enemy shouts lies at us. God whispers truth. Jesus wants us to come closer. He's not going to fill you up by screaming at you. A pastor will. A preacher will. Usually it's just to get people's attention. But Jesus doesn't have to. He says, come closer. I need you to come closer. And the last thing God says to him, verse 15, the Lord said, go back the way you came. 
There's proof he's going in the wrong direction. I don't know if you know anything about directions. I'm not very good with directions at all. I could say, uh, I'm going to go to Walmart. I have a terrible habit of this. I'll be like, I'm going to go to Walmart. Where's Walmart? Is it that way? Okay, see, I don't know. But that's my point every time. Because I, I'll point behind me because it's probably behind me. It was earlier, so it's got to be now. So I don't know anything about directions. But I know if God tells you to go back the way you came from, you were going the wrong direction. Doesn't take a genius. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat from Abel, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Haziel. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve, you're the only one, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. You're not the only one. I've been there. I felt it. This right here is pretty much proof you're not the only one. Ever. This illustration wouldn't have worked if there was only one person sitting here. But I'm glad there's more than that. <laughs> you're not the only one. There's others. Reach out for help. Ask any of us. Check out New Life. Shameless plug. We meet at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings, 6.30 on Wednesdays. We're here to help. This entire church is here to reach out to people that think they're alone. I don't know how many people I've seen come through this door that I wanted to reach out to, that I've reached out to, that pastors have told me about, or you just see them come through the door and you know they're broken and they're beaten. And it's okay. And they just want someone to love on. You're not the only one. So Elijah went from there. So the third thing God told Elijah to do is get back to work. And that's where I'm at. That part never ends. It's the last step. Now, these steps are continuous all the time. You get up tomorrow, you got to get up and eat. you got to do these things. you got to fill up all the time. You mean i got to read my Bible every day? Every stinking day. <coughs> i got to read it an hour a day? No. But get some word in there. we got a couple minutes. I want to pray for you guys. I never, since I've been here, said... Bow your head and close your eyes. But I'm going to say it today. For only one reason. Because my hand will probably go up. If you're sitting here and you know that you know you feel empty. You have felt empty recently or for a long time. Like I said, this includes me. Um... Just one personal thing yesterday. Um, I posted a lot yesterday. Um, I watched a preacher on YouTube pour his guts out. This was from a year ago because his son had just gone into rehab and he poured his guts in front of 2,000 people. Now I've got things I'm dealing with and we've all got stuff we're dealing with. It's, I mean... Missing the marks all sin to God. So, you know, if I say I'm dealing with sin, it doesn't mean that I was just down at stimulators last Saturday. I've just got stuff that I um, would like to get right with God. But if that's you, I ask you to be bold enough to raise your hand tonight, now. I want to pray for you, pray with you, and hook up in prayer with you. Father God, I praise you and I thank you for this group. I thank you for Pastor and Pastor's heart for lost people. Thank you for Pastor's heart for broken people. 
We've all been there. Everybody in this room has been broken. But Lord, we thank you for that brokenness. We thank you for bringing us to a place of submission and finding us in our brokenness. Lord, help us be humble. Help us reach out to others. Lord, help us eat better this week. However that is. Lord, if we like podcasts like I do, hook them up. Let us find people that we connect with. Or if we like the Bible, help us study better. Keep us awake at night when we're reading the Bible. Lord, help us stand before you. Because when it comes down to it, God, that's the real thing right there. The standing before you. And knowing without you, we are nothing but filthy rags. But your power, God, your power cleanses us. All we do is receive it. Lord, help us get back to work. Doing your will. Reaching your people for you. God, I thank you for everybody that raised their hand. Whatever specific situation they're going through. Lord, give them a word. Give them a touch. Send people into their paths that understand. Help them know that they're not alone. We're here. Others are here. Family can be there. If there's no family, give them a family. I thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. That was awesome. Give him a hand.